and my name is Lauren Humaneski, and we're happy to welcome you back for our final lecture of the spring series. Thank you so much for joining us. Bridges Academy is a continuing education lecture series for lifelong learners hosted by the University of San Diego's Office of Plan Giving. You all have a tremendous impact on the University of San Diego. The Bridges Endowed Scholarship, which is supported by the attendees of Bridges Academy, has been awarded to two students per year over the last 15 years. We are so grateful for your support and generosity and so glad that you're part of the USD Torero family. Please note that we will have a period for Q&A at the end of the lecture today. You may submit questions through the chat feature in Zoom. And if you look at the bottom of your screen within the Zoom window, there will be a chat icon. And if you click on that icon, you should have the ability to type and submit your questions. Um, and then I will present them to Dr. Miller. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Channon Miller. Dr. Channon S. Miller, PhD, is an assistant professor of history at the University of San Diego and co-founder of the Budding Africana Studies Program. She offers courses on Black life, history, culture, and Black women's her stories in America. She received her PhD in American Studies from Boston University in May of 2017. She began her doctoral journey in the fall of 2011 after graduating from Trinity College in Connecticut. Dr. Miller is from Hartford, Connecticut, and her community is the foundation of her life and her work. Placing the city within the pages of Black history is at the fore of her writing and research. The lives and activism of the city's Black people since the years of the Great Migration and mass immigration from the Afro-Caribbean, as well as the travails of Hartford's, Hartford's Black mothers, is the focus of her present pieces. Dr. Miller, we are so pleased to be able to welcome you this morning. I will go ahead and turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, Lauren, for that introduction and for the Bridges Academy for having me today. I am really glad for the opportunity to discuss various topics that I have had an opportunity to share with, with, with colleagues and students alike. And, and I'm glad to be here before you all today. The theme or the focus as, as Lauren described and shared prior for this conversation is protecting Black history, protecting Black lives. So I'll share a couple of ideas today that draw this connection between the value of, of, of Black life and particularly how that's closely linked to the value of Black history, that, that these are interconnected, that one cannot exist without the other, and the ways in which not protecting Black history or not elevating or centering or knowing Black history, the, the cost of that in contemporary Black America and on the lives of contemporary Black Americans. So I will share my screen so that I can capture a few uh, images for everyone. I necessarily want to begin off with talking a little bit about uh, a guy or scholar by the name of Carter G. Woodson. So Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of Black history. He was born in 1875, uh, lived until 1950, and was the son of former slaves, and ultimately understood how important gaining a proper education was when striving to secure freedom. And although he did not begin his formal education until he was 20 years old, his dedication to study enabled him to earn a high school diploma, his first undergraduate degree from Berea College in Kentucky and a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Chicago. And he would become the second African-American to earn a PhD in history from Harvard University. Dr. Carter G. Woodson is particularly known for, although he would develop several associations and journals that would dedicate themselves to the study of Black history, he's particularly known for initiating Negro History Week in 1926, which correspond with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. And the goal of this week was to, was to celebrate Black contributions to, to US society and, and to the world as a whole. And as we all have come to know, in 1976, this celebration was expanded to include the entire month of February and is now celebrated, again, globally and, and internationally. In uh, 1933, Dr. Woodson would publish The Miseducation of the Negro. And in this book, he lamented that the American educational system had missed the mark 
especially in regard to the schooling of its Black pupils. He stated that, quote, the so-called modern education brings the Negro's mind under the control of his and hers uh, oppressor, for they are taught the same economics, history, philosophy, literature, and religion, which have established the present code of morals. He shared that day to day, Black people, young and old, are required to study, read, and commit to mind tenets that each make clear to the Negro that they are the antithesis of the strong and divinely ordained, that they are to assume the status of the weak. Thus, the problem of holding the Negro down, he says, is easily resolved. He states that when you control a man and woman's thinking, you do not have to worry about their actions. You do not have to tell them not to stand here or go yonder. They will find their proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send them to the back door. They will go without being told. In fact, there is no, if there is no back door, they will cut one for their special benefit. Their education makes it necessary. For Woodson, while miseducation signified, tra signified chains, education translated to freedom. And he declared that an adequate education for African-Americans, an adequate education that included the telling of their history is so socially, culturally related to their needs would shed light on a strong black heritage and does not distort the, the centrifugal role black people have played in areas of leadership and innovation and global citizenship, that this education would allow black people to nurture self-awareness, but also equip them with the ability to do far more than go through a back door and contest a white America that builds the back door to begin with. In 1963, James Baldwin, novelist, writer, uh, activist, would articulate many of these ideas and, and reckons with history and its mythologies and the miseducation of the Negro in a talk he gave in 1963 called The Negro Child and His Self-Image. And here I've captured a quote from that talk where he shares that what I've tried to sketch in this time and what's become thoroughly clear, at least to me, is that any Negro who was born in this country and undergoes the American educational system runs the risk of becoming schizophrenic. On the one hand, he is born in the shadow of the stars and stripes, and he is assured that it represents a nation which has never lost a war. He pledges allegiance to that flag, which guarantees liberty and justice for all. He is part of a country in which anyone can become president and so forth. But on the other hand, he is also assured by his country and his countrymen that he has never contributed anything to civilization, that his past is nothing more than a record of humiliations gladly endured, humiliations gladly endured. And he continues by saying in another passage that that Black children are assumed that the Republic that, that he, his father, his parents, his ancestors lived in, that they lived in this, in this nation as happy people, shiftless, watermelon-eating darkies who love Mr. Charlie and Miss Anne, that the value he has as a Black man is proven by one thing only, and that is his devotion to white people. And he says, if you think I am exaggerating, examine the myths which proliferate in this country about Negroes. Elsewhere in this speech, he emphasizes that the American white man has lost his grip on reality, created these myths about Negroes, myths about his own history, myths about the world, and that these myths are designed to perpetuate the aims of society, that that history isn't being taught in, in any way without without purpose, without reason, that education is not structured uh, with that without purpose and clear intention. These, these lessons, uh, these ideas, this the literature that's distributed, the discourse that's cultivated within and outside of the academy is meant to serve a particular purpose, and that is to sustain the status quo to miseducate the Negro so that they can be silenced, so that their resistance is nearly impossible. It's key to justifying white supremacy and ensuring that Black lives are without sanctuary. When the sanctity of Black history 
when the fullness of Black history is not protected, neither is the, the fullness of and the sanctity of Black lives. And we can turn to the contemporary understandings of the modern Black freedom struggle of the 1950s and 60s to capture this. Again, beyond the academy, within our schoolhouses, within our classrooms, but also in mainstream media, in everyday conversations, in discourse, in the news, the ways in which the, the, the public sphere overall tells and remembers the Black past is telling of the perpetuity of a history withheld, a history that oppresses rather than lends to Black freedom. The protests in response to the police murder of George Floyd last year were often compared to that of the Black freedom struggle of the 50s and 60s and were demeaned actually in comparison. And some of us might recall that. They were said, these contemporary organizers and activists were said to have defied a more appropriate, a more just, a more rightful way of doing things, that they, that they needed to be peaceful, quote unquote, peaceful or nonviolent in the ways that the movement was in the past. And much of this language, much of these character, characterizations of, of the movement, of the civil rights movement are based in miseducation, miseducation of American people as a whole and restrained understandings of the past. It's a romanticization of the past guided by the same racial myth mythologies that James Baldwin talks about, the mythologies that assert that Black rage, that Black uprisings are unjustified, mythologies that forbid a telling of the reality that the movement was not singular, but included a, a myriad of visions, of, of strategies, of, of ideas not limited to those practiced, for example, within the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 uh, with some of those involved and many of those involved, including Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. pictured here. But rarely does the discourse include quotes from John Lewis, such as this one, where he would articulate after the Bloody Sunday on March 7th, 1965, he would say that we're only flesh. I can understand people not wanting to be beaten anymore. Black capacity to believe that a white person would really open his heart, open his life to nonviolent appeal was running out. What I love about this quote, and it's been a, a quote that I've used and thought about and read and reread so often over the last year, is that here, John Lewis, who we, who we honor uh, continuously, but, but don't fully reckon with the fullness even of his legacy, speaks to the movement as a violent one, not as a peaceful one, not as a quiet one, not as one that did not come without cost and Black suffering. He speaks to Black fatigue and tiredness and exhaustion. He speaks to the ways in which the movement was filled with blood and scars. And he also speaks to a desire among many Black people, even if not him, but among many Black people to do things differently, a desire to no longer suffer anymore. The Black freedom struggle that we valorize in the present was also one that, especially in the latter half of the 1960s, would center self-defense, would, would center resisting the bloodied heads, the, the, the fatigue that I just referenced, and the exhaustion. It overall abandoned, uh, strongly abandoned the nonviolent strategies of the Southern Christian Leadership Council or of what would become the Old Guard. Stokely Carmichael of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who would assume presidency of this critical uh, civil rights organization after John Lewis, would write about this change in the New York Review in 1966 and, and would speak to a changing tide, would speak to new visions and new desires for the movement. And you can take a look at this quote where, where he writes that and reflects on the tragedies of the movement thus far. He says, one of the tragedies of the struggle against racism is that up to now, there has been no national organization which could speak to the growing militancy of young Black people in the urban ghetto of the North and of the West. 
there has only been a civil rights movement whose tone of voice was adapted to an audience of liberal whites. It served as a sort of buffer zone between them and angry blacks. None of its so-called leaders could go into a riding community and be listened to. And he says, in a sense, I blame ourselves with the mass media for what has happened in Watts, Harlem, Chicago, Cleveland, Omaha. And here he is referencing the uprisings that would take place throughout the late 1960s, again, in urban areas where there were young black people who weren't touched by the movement. Their, their everyday lives were left unchanged. They were in ghettos, they were hungry, they were poor. Yes, the civil rights movement had passed, the Voting Rights Act as well, but, but their everyday lives were, were unchanged, but what they did witness was, was Black trauma again and again. What they did witness was seeing Martin Luther King get slapped and ultimately assassinated. They would become angry, he says, when they would see the four little Black girls uh, bombed to death shortly after or around the time of the March on Washington. They were angrier when they saw that nothing happened uh, we had nothing to offer that they could see except to go out and be beaten again. We helped to build their frustration. So we have the arrival, or what Stokely Carmichael is, is documenting here is the arrival of a new ideology, but, but it's tied to I, an ideology that always existed, but, but now it becomes more prominent. This, this notion of, of Black power, which argued for Black people turning inward, coming together to build power bases that would allow them to wield control over their own lives and their own life outcomes. They no longer aim to depend upon white uh, alliances or white liberals to sympathize or empathize with them. They want to depend on one another. They want to vote in ways where the people in office represent their community and their needs. They also refused to speak in the tone of uh, in the tone of of the outside community. They they don't desire to be a buffer zone because to be a buffer zone between the black masses and white society means that something is getting lost in the process. That the real full needs of black people are being left to the wayside. If you have to rearticulate ideas in a way that the dominant white society deems appropriate, if you have to articulate ideas in a way that that in sometimes has to concede to the mythologies that it, that exist about black people. So black power and this rising aspect of the freedom struggle is interested in using the words that they want to use, not just the words others want to hear. And they will do so no matter what the response is, no matter what the, the characterizations are, irregardless of the, the villainization that may come from that because they refuse to give historical myths about Black resistance and historical myths about what and how Black people should live and move, they refuse to give that credit. To refuse a full retelling of Black history, to even de-radicalize people like Lewis and, and activists like Martin Luther King and, and recast their efforts in ways that, that represents them as undisruptive, and even to mute Black radicalism. So the work of, of Black power activists has really limited uh, our understanding of the complexities of the Black freedom struggle, which, which was critical to even the stationing or the progress of Black people that's evident in the present. But it's also worked to silence and suppress the contemporary movement when the sanctity, again, of history is not protected, neither is the sanctity of Black lives and the sanctity of Black resistance. I also want to consider the ways in which retellings of history refuse our, our understandings of the full scope of anti-Black violence. And uh, something that I want to highlight here is, is a discussion of, of gender. And this is one of the classes or is a major part of one of the classes I teach here at USD African American Women's History. Uh, being able to teach that class has, has meant so much to me because uh, part of the effort or the goal of the class is to really 
combat the historical mythologies around Black people, but also mythologies that really erase Black women and their, their roles within Black America, within America as a whole, but also the ways in which anti-Blackness is gendered, the ways in which anti-Blackness is intersectional. So being able to teach that class has truly been a gift because it's allowed me to contextualize for students cases such as that of, that of Breonna Taylor. Uh, and, and, and why the responses to that case were different from that of uh, folks like George Floyd. Here I just have images of, of some of my favorite texts that off, offer us a window into the fullness of the movement, the, the ways in which it involved various forms of resistance, including, uh, including self-defense, including a uh, inviting and invalidating Black rage and, and uprisings, as well as a, an acknowledgement of, of the radical dimensions of, of people like Rosa Parks, uh, who's also really placed within a, a neutral colorblind type of, of, of box and where her own dimensions, complex dimensions of her activism, which mimic and mirror so much of the activism of younger people today is, is, is not quite seen. With Brianna Taylor, I, I talk to my students about often the, uh, of course, reckoning with and creating space for her, her murder on March 13th, 2020 by Louisville, Kentucky police officers. We talk about the outrage and mobilization that, that took place within Brianna Taylor's local community. But we also, think about how and trace the ways in which it was slow to rise outside of Louisville, where these events occurred and how it did not garner the national response that the police murder of George Floyd did in Minnesota on May 25th, which, which followed Breonna Taylor's killing. And we think about how the nation swiftly picked up the charge of local organizers and residents to demand the state to indict the officers and abolish the police department, the mass protests that occurred in every state, and how that did not immediately occur for, for Breonna Taylor. Both Breonna Taylor and George Floyd are signposts of the contemporary state's institutionalized misrecognition of Black life as inherently valuable. Their cases both stem from the proclivity of police to brutalize Black people at higher rates than other groups and the paternal acquittal of these officers. Yet Breonna Taylor's name did not arise as a focal point of nationwide mass protest until the murder of George Floyd. And this is an issue of, of gender-based exclusion. But, but digging deeper, I understand this issue to be one of history, to be uh, a rooted in a, in a retellings of history that are, that are masculine or men-centered. Stories are stories that we tell about America's past, about uh, anti-Black state sanctioned violence don't tend to include discussions of gender and conceal gendered racism as a part of the root of anti-Black state sanctioned violence. The attempts to forbid a telling of Black women as victims of white supremacist terrors and lynchings, which they were, uh, and the realities of, of the Black college student organizers captured in this photo at Howard University, where in their protest for a federal law against lynching in the 1940s, a law that would never pass, they embody and demonstrate that lynching is to their fate as well, and that it's intricately tied to the fate of Black men, that their lives are also on the line. Our nation's collective memory of anti-Black violence also forbids a telling of the gendered uh, mechanisms of anti-Black violence, like sexual violation. And I find this quote from Hazel Carby, another historian, to be really uh, telling. And, and in one of her pieces, she shares that the institutionalized rape of Black women has never been as powerful a symbol of Black oppression as the spectacle of lynching. Rape has always involved patriarchal notions of women being at best not entirely unwilling accomplices, if not outwardly inviting sexual attack. The links between Black women and illicit sexuality consolidated during the antebellum years and had powerful ideological consequences for the next 150 years. 
So what she's saying here is one of the key reasons why we don't reckon with the gendered mechanisms of anti-Black violence, the ways in which sexual assault was a tool of Jim Crow, was a tool of white supremacy, is also linked to our ideologies about Black women's bodies, which developed in slavery, this notion that they are rapeable, this notion that their bodies are without borders, that they're hypersexual, lewd, illicit, and that they aren't deserving of, of protection, that they aren't women at all. And anti-Blackness combined with these particular ideologies function to, to erase them from the narrative. Another telling quote is from Kimberly Crenshaw, who in one of her podcasts talks about a racism in law course she took. And you can take a look at this quote here where uh, she, she mentions that she was in a class where a professor was talking about the horrors of, of Black slavery. And he turns, as she says, as in, inevitably one must to the experiences of Black women being bred. But the way he talked about it was this. He said, imagine what it must have been like to be forced to stand by and watch while your daughter, your wife, your sister, your mother, your aunt, or your grandmother was forcibly taken in order to reproduce the slave population. Imagine what that must have been like. And she says, I remember thinking as bad as that was, it couldn't have been as bad as being the grandmother, of being the, the daughter, the wife, the sister. And she says there was something in this moment that suggested that the gaze upon which the story of slavery's brutality is told from is still a masculine at vantage point. Like, quote, I was not able to protect, I was not able to avenge. And what is this telling us about what is missing from the narrative? What are the consequences of seeing anti-Blackness as something that only affects Black men? A consequence is that when we talk about police brutality, a contemporary iteration of, of lynching is that we don't think about or open our eyes to see Black women as victims as well. And Kimberly Crenshaw is also an architect of the Say Her Name campaign, where ultimately this, this campaign asserts that it is critical to, to proclaim, to announce, to say out loud the names of Black women who are police brutality victims. Black women are invisible within an already invisible group, which means that the silence can be deafening. So intentionality is required in order for justice to be achieved. And Say Her Name asked this critical question and they asked is how many more Black lives can we protect if we center a gender inclusive approach to racial justice that centers all Black lives equally? They argue that to advance justice for all Black lives, we must not only interject the names of Black women brutalized and slain by law enforcement, but wholly, uh, what I also want to add into that is we must recast the history of anti-Black state-sanctioned violence to include all Black people. Black freedom and the fullness thereof is contention upon a narration of the American past that illuminates rather than conceals the deaths of anti-Black policing. For example, when we talk about slavery, uh, when we think about how can we retell this history in a way that makes the names of these women who are invisible compared to the names of the black men captured at the top of this timeline, pictured are the, the, the several women who have died prior to or, or in between or after Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Stefan Clark, Alton Sterling, Freddie Gray, that in the midst of those major events that made the news, there were, there were other, other tragedies occurring that, that didn't do the same. So what if we, we saw Breonna Taylor or Atlantia Jefferson before we got to May, before, before we got to May 25th uh, with, with, the, with the murder of George Floyd? But thinking about or rethinking how we do slate, how we redo or talk about history can be revealing. Uh, a gender inclusive approach to understanding slavery, for example, or that the house of bondage is to think about how when it came to law enforcement in that period. So law enforcement undoubtedly molds and informs in this period of slavery as a tool of, of Black punishment to punish and contain and control enslaved Black peoples to ensure that freedom wasn't a possibility. But when we tell this history, we do want to be sure to acknowledge and account for enslaved Black women. 
who also were affected by the rise of the penal institution and the rise of black slavery. Their forced labor and containment was also a part of this, this process of, of suppression. Runaways were sent to jail. Uh, runaways were uh, also received corporal punishment in the form of whippings while they were in jail. And, and Black women were undoubtedly among those incarcerated, among those who were punished for attempts at resisting or attempts at rebellion. And here from a book called A Black Woman's History of the United States, historians Dana Berry and Callie Gross include one of many examples of an enslaved woman named Phoebe of Virginia who would go to jail after running away and was confined. They also highlight that while there, it would appear that Phoebe, according to those writing about these events, they said that Phoebe suspended herself by the neck with the handkerchief tied to a bar of the window. These historians ask, was this a case of foul play or did Phoebe take her life? We have no way of knowing who else might have visited her in jail or her relationship with the staff, but we do have questions about who was responsible for her death. And it's interesting that if we talked more about people like Phoebe, uh, cases such as that of Sandra Bland, a Black woman who would also be said to have killed herself while in jail or within police custody just a few years ago in Texas, that, that it would cause us to ask different questions and ask these questions about the circumstances of her death much sooner uh, to raise, to raise uh, questions or, or critical questions to the police department, which would suggest that there was no foul play at all. Uh, again, what happens to our understanding of anti-Black violence when we center and include the stories of Black women? I also want to acknowledge another critical component of, of law enforcement and, and, and policing and Black women. Convict leasing is another aspect of Black history that also is told through a primarily male-centered lens. But thankfully, uh, again, historians, uh, Black women historians like Talitha LaFloria focuses her work on Black women, convict leasing victims in the post-emancipation South, a penal enterprise that would ultimately re-enslave Black Americans for profit. So while they were free, according to the 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment would also declare that if they were incarcerated, that slavery was legal and that the profitization of their labor for various corporations was legal as well. So we have Black people being incarcerated for, for petty charges, for petty crimes, and having an opportunity to have their bodies uh, exploited. And this is something that Black men at large experienced and were the vast majority of those on chain gangs and convict leases, but Black women also were in the number. And while they only made up only 3% of all these lease felons, they represented more than 98% of the female prison population. So they were more represented in these prisons than white women. Even when we think about the Jim Crow period, uh, I also or often call it or refer to an African-American woman's history as Jane Crow, using a terminology uh, crafted by another Black scholar of the mid 20th century, Polly Murray, a Black woman queer scholar, would be the first to refer to the period as such to really account for how this is a system after the brief reconstruction period that is Oh, that is about and centered around the control and regulation of Black freedom, the taking away of citizenship rights, but how it does include very specific gender tools that, uh, that allow for and involve the routine violation of Black women, the routine and everyday sexual violation of Black women was critical to Jim Crow and actually would be one of the major spurs of the civil rights movement, was this desire for Black people to reclaim dignity, but also to protect Black women. That's, that's in fact how Rosa Parks got her start, was, was through working around the sexual violation of, of Black women, Black women who were victims of mob violence, and in particular, a sexual assault by vigilantes and home invaders as well. Here, I just have a quote uh, from uh, LaShawn Harris that is also telling about what, what the power of history holds when it comes to protecting Black lives and all Black lives. And she says here that even as justice continues to be denied, Black women, social justice leaders, writers, and intellectuals 
are advancing the intellectual and political work of their foremothers, and that in raising the veil on Black women's experiences with state-sanctioned violence, that they are fighting for and demanding for a form of legal justice and protection that, that inspires us all to say her name and also tell her story. Hashtag tell her story. That is all I will say for now regarding this discussion around the power of history, but also how protecting Black history can lend to a protection of Black lives. And I'm definitely open for questions at this time as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for being here and Thank sharing you. your vast knowledge with us. We really appreciate it and particularly a relevant and um, engaging topic. And we're so thankful for your time this morning. Um, I did receive a few questions in the chat, but if anybody else has remaining questions, please do send them through the chat feature and we will present them to Dr. Miller. Um, the, let me pull it up here. The first question is, it was shared in your biography that you're a co-founder of the Budding Africana Studies Program at USD. Can you discuss that program and how you envision it evolving and becoming a larger part of campus? Yes, well, it had been something that a few of us a faculty were thinking about for, for quite some time. Faculty, there's several of us across disciplines who, who also find a home in Black studies, Africana studies. Our work centers around Black people, Black lives in the U.S. and globally. And we would meet students who really wanted to have a field of study where they could dedicate a good amount of time to studying a Black life, Black history, Black culture. And yes, they could take our classes for sure uh, separately or, or, or squeeze it into their schedules. But if it wasn't a major or minor, they still wouldn't be able to take considerable time to really sit in the field and plant themselves. And so we figured that it would be a good idea to, in light of our interest and the interests of a great deal of students, to propose a minor in Africana Studies. And this is a minor that we're that we will uh, are excited to bring in folks within within history, such as Dr. David Miller, who I see here, but also some of our colleagues in sociology and uh, theology, philosophy. There are so many great courses on, on Black life in all of those departments, even, even psychology and the arts and these other fields. So we're hoping to bring all of those courses and curriculum together into one place. But ultimately the goal was to really elevate a Black-centered curriculum, uh, a curriculum that centers the, the developments in, in, in Black life, globally, but also various aspects of Black culture, and to do so unapologetically as well. And we're actually going to be launching that in the fall, this coming fall semester, and the first chair of the, of the new minor will be Dr. T.J. Talley, who's also in history. And so the goal is over the years to share kind of the, the, the labor of, of chairing such a program and, and even hoping to uh, expand it with time, perhaps, if, if it goes well and successfully. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's great to hear that that is coming to our campus. It's extremely valuable to our campus and yes. students. So thank you. Um, another question we had here was, is there any literature that you recommend? Yeah, so uh, books that I recommend, there, there are so many and there's there's so there's good stuff coming out every year, every month. I'm even struggling to keep up. I, I have a long reading list ahead of me that that I can't wait to engage myself. But but some books that I that I think are are are, are willing are great to engage that are great for the general public includes a book that I just recently referenced, The Black Woman's History of the United States. I, I love this book because they intended to write it for the greater public. They want it to be read by students and adults and families. And they actually cover uh, US history from the slave trade up until the present. And they managed to do so in, in, a, in a size of, in a, in a book that's actually not, not quite large. It's readable. You can read it over the course of a week or two weeks, but they capture so much detail and it allows for a gendered analysis of black history and US history, which is great. I also 
really want to reference the book that I included uh, in one of my slides, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, uh, which is another text that can maybe help complicate existing understandings of this iconic figure as well. Another uh, text that I particularly enjoy is We Will Shoot Back, Armed Resistance in the Mississippi Freedom Movement is also speaks to an unspoken, uh, too often unspoken aspect of the movement, which is black, black self-defense. Thank you so much for sharing those. And one other question we had here, and this is the last question that's come in. So if anybody has any other questions they'd like to submit, please do so within the next few moments. But the other question was, you talk about uh, the miseducation of the past. How do we correct that and improve that? And how could we improve education in schools? I know you touched a bit about on that in your first question, but um, I guess on a larger scale as well. Right. Yes, I mean, first and foremost, and I see so many developments in schools as well. I know that my home state of Connecticut has mandated uh, in high schools has created and mandated black and, and Latina studies or uh, required that high schoolers must take courses in those areas. So that's a step forward. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that this history is being taught in full ways that we're not only talking about the history in ways that reflect racial myth mythologies. So for example, with Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, another important figure I talk about in my courses, it's important that even with, 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 with figures such as that, that we don't de-radicalize their visions for freedom, that we don't cast them as colorblind, that we don't position them in ways where they, they held these neutral positions on black freedom. They wanted black freedom by any means necessary. And that was the focus of their lives and their passions and their visions. And it's important that we center that because there's a way in which that he has been uh, de-neutralized, but also de-racialized, where he's also been, there's been a distance placed between him and Black people, and, and, and where he's also been used to condemn Black people, which is definitely not a part of what Martin Luther King Jr. and his vision was about. So I also think that we want to take care with how we treat our historical icons. We want to, we want to paint a full picture of their lives and of their commitments. We also want to be sure to center and involve all, all, all aspects of the Black freedom struggle, including Black radicalism. So radical thinkers such as Malcolm X, proponent of Black power, and in particular, Black nationalism. We want to talk more about the other organizations of the Black power struggle, too, and how critical they were to the pride of Black folk in the 70s and 60s, to the sustainment of their communities. They provided resources to Black communities that the government had not and had failed to for quite some time. Time, I'm not sure where Black Black folk will be without the Black power era. And you can talk to any Black person that's maybe in their 60s or 70s now. I talk to my mom about this all the time. And she says that after Martin Luther King was assassinated, that they there was this immense sense of grief and trauma, even where she was from in Connecticut, that all of her community, she grew up in a Black community, all the youth had lost hope had a sense of, of despair. They, they didn't want to go to school. They, they, they didn't want to do anything. But then when Black power began to rise, she says it just it, it made them alive again. It made them love themselves. It made them think that they could have control of their lives in ways that they didn't think of before. And that's the experiences of so many Black people. So it's a movement that I really hope that we can see more of. And I think we are, but I hope we can see more of it in the classroom and in the media. Uh, there's a new film called Judas and the Black Messiah that won an Oscar recently. It's really good. And I hope that that is, a, is one of the many signs that we're going to see more of that time period to come. Yes, certainly. Well, thank you so much. And one more question that we had come in. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for this important lesson today. Would you please speak a bit about the classes that you teach at USD? 
Yes. So I am teaching or the classes that I primarily have been teaching thus far include African American history, African American women's history and American woman in history. And I just proposed a new course where I will be teaching, um, hopefully, well, it was accepted, but uh, hope to teach a course on black nationalism and black feminism. And I'll be doing this with a professor in theology, Dr. Jamal Caller, we're gonna do a joint or, or a shared class. Uh, but I also have some other classes I'm hoping to propose in the, in the pipeline as well that I'm so excited about classes on the history of the Black family, for example, and on the uh, Black diaspora within the United States and the, the history of the connections between Black people from all over the world within the U.S., Haiti or Cuba and African Americans. Some of their relationships and dynamics, I think, are so interesting, and, and I'd like to be teaching about that too. That's great, and that's so valuable to our campus community, and thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to welcome you this morning and learn a bit from you. Um, again, it was a very valuable and informational, um, educational morning, so thank you so much for being here. We are so appreciative of your time and cannot wait to see what you do on campus and um, hope to see you again soon. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to talk with you all today. Thank you all for coming and, and definitely hope to continue uh, dialogue with you all more in, in, in the future. Thank you for coming.